Welcome to my radio story podcast, where I invite radio pros like these great ones you're going to see and ask them, how did their radio story start? Where are they now and how did they get there? Episode one, legendary New York City, uh, incredible guy, Paul Cubby Bryant. He's the morning co-host of the Cubby and Christine uh, show. It's at weekdays, 530 to 9 on 106.7 Light FM in New York City. Cubby, welcome and thank you for being the first one. Hey, thank you for having me, man. I mean, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing to be the first one, but I am your guinea pig and I'm here for you, dude. And thank you for the intro. Oh, very, you're very welcome. I, it, what's very interesting about radio, and we've talked about it before, is sometimes you don't meet people till later, but you know their name, and then you meet them later, and that's just so cool how that happens. It's just a small community. So tell me, how, when, and where did you start in radio? So my radio career started in 1988 uh, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's where I got my foot in the door at a radio station called WGH in Norfolk. And I don't know about you, Dan, but I fell in love with the radio initially before 1988 just by winning a contest uh, on the radio. I, I, I think I, like a, like I won a Glory Estefan CD in 1984 or something. But I was more blown away by how the DJ played me back on the radio and how it sounded and that whole theater of the mind. And I really became fixated on radio. So I was that guy bothering radio DJs, calling uh, different DJs, asking if I can be on the air and can I introduce a song. And I befriended a couple. And it was in 1988 that one DJ said, you know, you've been calling me for a couple of years. And why don't you come down and answer some phones for me? And um, I got my first intern job in 1988 at WGH in Norfolk. It was a top 40 station. And, um, he, you know, and then I would start creeping in the production room after hours and making fake air checks. And next thing you know, I was I was part time and, and um, doing weekend shifts. And at the time I was 16 years old. So that's how I got my nickname Cubby, because my real name is Paul Bryant. And a few people knew of the football coach in Alabama, Alabama, you remember um, Paul Bear Bryant? So his nickname was Bear. His real name was Paul Bryant. So people put two and two together, and they're like, are you related? I'm like, no. And they go, well, you're definitely not a bear, but you're you're 16 years old, just crack 17, really, and um, you're on the radio already in a pretty decent market. You're, you're a baby. You're just a cubby. And they all started calling me Cubby, and I hated it. <laughs> and and our, my program director said, you should use it on the air. So it just became a thing. Paul Cubby Bryant, all three names, and uh, I've been using it for years. Over the years, I've dropped the Cubby. But, um, you know, that's how it all started. Your time in Norfolk, what did you learn in those early years that you've taken along your journey into now in New York City that, that oh, I love that these men and women taught me these great things, and I just still practice them today? You know, I just learned a lot about me personally, actually. You know, the um, radio mechanics kind of came along as, as time went on. But um, I, I just saw so many people in this business and what a small world it is. And um, I, I kind of just wanted to be nice to everybody because I feel like that you're going to see the same people on the way up as uh, you might see on the way down. And I, I remember being an intern for just six months. And I saw a couple of people lose their jobs, and you know, I, I saw some people that were dicks, and I saw some people that were really nice. And um, I don't know, it just it, it kind of formed my my personality a little bit. I mean, um, being around a, um, a, I guess the people that taught me well um, that were there at the time, they just they really instilled a a, a, a work ethic that um, I don't know, it, it just made me. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, I feel like they molded me. Um, the people that my first radio station molded me into who I am now because um, I worked with just great people. Um, you know, what they taught me with radio is a whole different question. But as far as what my first radio station taught me, um, it was really about just be kind to everybody. Sounds like some, you know, like the cheesy Ellen DeGeneres line, but um, it just taught me to be nice to everybody. So, what are one of the two? one maybe two three people there that really made an impression on you and you developed a relationship with them and maybe you still have it today well tony mccraney was the program director and he's currently doing talk radio in norfolk still um he was the kind of guy that kind of gave me 
no rules. It was um, he guided me on the air and and gave me advice, obviously, but he wasn't this um, hotline program director. He just let me make my mistakes, and I made plenty. And he would tell me in passing, like the next day, um, you know what I did wrong, but it wasn't like a big thing, you know, it just made me more comfortable and it helped me, um, develop quicker. I feel the other pivotal guy in my life was a guy named Jeff Moreau, um, who gosh, he was doing afternoons and he was the guy that would like say, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You can run the board, but he'd be gone for like 30 minutes. So I knew he was letting me, um, either he was taking one hell of a dump or, um, he, I think he knew I loved like learning how to run the board and and um he could see the excitement in my eyes so he would let me play around in the studio uh and he was a guy i initially used to call um and he said come on down to the radio station and then the other guy would probably be mj kelly aka todd schnitt um he was you know in tampa for a long time um after i worked with him he did the power pig um he's you know did plj for a while um and he was one of the, he was our night guy at the time, and he was also one of those people that could see that fire in my eyes, and and that I loved radio, and um, would really just sit down with me and and help me. I think a lot of times um, people don't take the time to to talk to young people anymore and help them out because there's, if life is so busy and we're so distracted. This was a very patient time. I feel like um, the late '80s, um, where people kind of rooted for you, and yeah, you know, you want to do what I do? Let me show you. I felt like there was more more of that back then. So what was your journey from Norfolk to New York City? Now I know, but definitely the viewers want to know, how'd you go from Norfolk all the way to New York City? What was in between? Yeah, I'll tell you the quick abbreviated version. I promise I won't make this long, but um, I was lucky I didn't live out of a suitcase. A lot of DJs live out of a suitcase and they're they're traveling a lot. I was very lucky in that aspect. I've only lived in three towns pretty much. Um, So Intern in 1988, made it to part-time in 1988 at WGH in Norfolk, the top 40 station. Then I was the night guy from, uh, full-time night guy from 6 to 10, uh, my senior year in high school. I was on like the Z100 of my hometown um, doing nights. Um, And that was until August of 1990 when Susquehanna Radio um, changed our format. And they fired everybody and they pulled me aside and said, hey, listen, um, you're more than welcome to hang around here if you like country music, but we have a property in Houston for you that we think you might like. Would you be into it? And at that time, I just graduated high school, and all my friends were going to college. And I'm like, wow, I kind of had plans to go to maybe community college for a year, then maybe to Virginia Tech, stay stay within the – in my state. But I'm like, wow, this timing is too good. It's August, and I'll just go to the real world instead of go to college. And so I went to KRBE in Houston and became the night guy at KRBE in Houston in September of 1990. Um, And then I became music director eventually. And then I was there until 1996. And then I was working with Tom Pullman at KRBE in Houston. And Tom Pullman at KRBE, we'd been working together for five years. And uh, he got the job offer to come to to New York in Z100. And... um, he, then he pulled me aside and says, we have a lot of work to do at Z100 because at the time it was we were coming off the doldrums of, of alternative, you know, dominating top 40, but it really wasn't. The, they were just playing top four. A, lo- a lot of top 40 stations were playing alternative because that was the thing to do, but um, really their ratings were in the tank and we had a lot of work to do. So Tom pulled me aside and said, would you like to join me? And how do you turn down Z100? I mean, it's hard not it's hard not to. So, um, even though I was very happy at KRBE in Houston, it was um, an involvement that came naturally, and I had to give it a shot. And luckily, it turned out great. So, it was um, you know Norfolk to Houston to New York, where I've been ever since. So that leads me to my next question, Paul Cubby Bryant. You <laughs> played so many different songs from Z100. KTU and now Light FM in New York City. What are the songs that come to mind to you when you heard them first? Things come to your mind, but they've changed over the years after hearing them. Any songs like that that you play now? I think, wow, when I first heard it, I thought about this, but now I think about this. I mean, I'm just a music lover in general, so every song that comes on, I have a 
a spot in my heart. I, mean, I really do like just about every song. Um, and, and being at Light FM, you know, Dan, from being there, that um, it's like right up my alley as far as the age goes because um, I played most of those songs when they were brand new. But, I mean, certain songs stand out, like um, Killing Me Softly by the Fugees. I, I remember being at Z100, and we were taking the station back uh, to CHR after it had been pretty rock-heavy. I remember the first time I heard Killing Me Softly and then playing it on Z100 going, wow, you know, this is a moment where, you know, music is kind of changing a little bit. And, um, and you know, it was a good thing, basically. It was a good thing. And then um, anytime I hear a Britney Spears song or Hanson, um, Spice Girls, you know, Backstreet Boys, those were periods in Top 40 that really helped bring back Top 40. You can make fun of those bands all you want. But we needed those kind of groups to really um, explode and bring Top 40 back. So the timing on that was was great. Um, so whenever I hear the beginning of Wannabe by Spice Girls, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I mean, yeah, part of me wants to turn it down, like not again, but part of me brings back these memories of like when Top 40 was making a huge comeback in the mid-90s, 96, 97. That was a time where... Just that was a big moment in my in my career when Top 40 was coming back after being kind of like in a holding pattern for a few years. Have you seen this TikTok video my friend showed me? I don't know where the DJ is, but he blindfolds himself and he says, I could talk up this song without even looking at the console and know the intro. I think you could easily do that, correct? I would hope so. I don't I mean, you know, I don't toot my own horn a lot, but I mean that was one thing one of my earlier program directors said to me. He said, uh, you know what you got, man? You got something that you can't teach. It's timing. And I didn't know quite what, quite what he meant, but I kind of did. And um, ever since he said that, you know, you're right. You can't teach it. Like, I'm, Dan, I'm sure you've met people that say, I want to be in radio. And you, maybe you, you'd make a fake audition tape for them. And you want to be encouraging, but, you know, they're when they ask, where's the clock that tells you when they're going to sing? If they usually ask that question, you know, it's just they're not born with that that instinctive clock. And I remember talking up records when I was like 14 in my bedroom, you know, and, and not even knowing what the post was. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, any, any song that comes on, I would probably say I could probably nail it, unless it's like Iron Butterfly. Uh, <laughs> and that might be too long. <laughs> I want to see you do this now for, for uh, Light FM. You got to put it, videotape it, and put it on the website. Well, you know who does it the best? Um, there's a lot of great people that can do that, but Broadway Bill Lee. I mean, yeah, a yeah. friend of mine, and a lot of respect. This guy might be the greatest um, intro talker upper ever. Uh, yeah, Broadway Bill Lee. I mean, if you follow him on Instagram, he, he oh, posts videos every now and then, and and he just every time I see him, it gets me like inspired. Final question. So. This is a small community where I call it a radio club and it's shrinking more and more with different aspects happening. How do you feel being a part of this radio club that I call it? Well, it's an honor. I mean, I'll tell you that. Um, it's also scary. Um, you know, like I still think radio has a lot of life left to it, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but, um, it, it, it's 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 an honor to still be doing it after all these years. And it's also scary to think that I'm closer to the end of my career than I am at the beginning, but um, I know I could go as long as I want. But um, no, it, it's, I, I still feel the same love I have for radio as I did when I was a kid. And I still know that despite all the competition out there, streaming services, satellite radio, you know, radio still is, uh, regular old terrestrial radio still is the leader. And um I I feel lucky that um, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And hopefully, I'll be doing this till the very end. I hear you. I always think of um, Roy Hobbs when he says, "God, I love baseball," yeah. and I just think, "God, I, I love radio." It's and it's in our blood, right? It really is. And to be honest with you, I can't do anything else. So this has to work out because I, I don't know how to do a damn thing. I mean, I've always thought what my backup plan would be. You know, I, I love flying, and I don't think I'd be a pilot. But even though I love to fly, I would I like, I'd like, to, like to work in air traffic control maybe. But I've thought, I, I've thought of things I might do, and i got to tell you, I, I, I wouldn't be good at anything. I just know radio because it, it's, it's all I've done since I was 16 years old. Um, 
So it's kind of a good and a bad thing. I've been doing it for a long time, so that's great. But I've also, it's the only thing I've been doing. So <laughs> this has got to work out, man. I hear you. Definitely. Well, you're awesome. You have no problems. Don't worry. Don't worry. Thank you for being my first guest on Tell Me Your Radio Story. Weekday mornings, 5.30 to 9.30. Cubby and Christine, 106.7 Light FM in New York City. Go to the iHeartRadio app. Listen to them. They are awesome. I'm Dan Blackman. I'll have more guests coming up. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Thank Thanks, you, Dan. Cubby. You're the you're the best, man.